Welcome to Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. And the gentleman sitting next to me today has also helped you get off <laughs> in various different ways. Okay. Uh, gay adult performer, Jonah Wheeler, how are you? I'm really good. I'm yeah. really happy to be here. I'm very happy that uh, we got our first scene in together today. Yeah, finally. Yeah. No, it's been a minute. You're, you're very hard to, to catch. You're <laughs> constantly traveling. You're constantly working. Tell us a little bit about what your schedule has been like. Um, After my post pandemic. <laughs> well, I only started the porn thing during the pandemic, so there was no version of this kind of pre pandemic. But yeah, since like traveling became a reasonable thing, I'm out of I'm out of New York about every other week. Um, typically for some sort of a gig, either I'm filming with the studio or I'm more often like I'm going to drop into San Francisco for four days and film with the people there, and go to Seattle for three days and film with local people and come home. So you started during the pandemic, um, OnlyFans, Just for Fans, fan sites. Yeah. And then you got noticed by studios. I was intentionally trying to get into studio work. Okay. Um, like, I think I got into porn envisioning studio work, and OnlyFans is now, like, instead taken over the, like, the heart of what I do, mm -hmm. which I'm actually really enjoying. Uh, but I've always been angling to do studio work because okay. I like... There's a how the sausage gets made about it of like what happens behind the camera, between the shots, the process of getting in there, setting like a goal for the scene and figuring out how to achieve it that I actually really enjoy. Mm -hmm. You said it right. Only fans and just for fans, fan sites, I feel like have taken, they've taken, they've taken the lead mm -hmm. at this point uh, where studios are struggling to keep up with them. But studios are still pumping out stuff. They're still making stuff. And mm -hmm. it's vastly different from one another. Yeah. OnlyFans is a little, it's, I don't know, what would you, would you consider it amateur? Mm -hmm. I would consider it amateur asterisk. Okay. Because, you know, there is, a, there are a lot of people who do it in a very, like, codified professional manner. Mm -hmm. Um but part of the intention is to look homegrown, even in that environment. Do you think that's the charm of OnlyFans and Just for Fans? I think the charm of it is that it can be so natural, mm -hmm. that it can be so personal. Um, and production, by default, is a little distancing. Like, the we've set up cameras and lights and a set and a concept... The more and more of that you add, the less casual and real of a thing it feels like. I have a strong feeling about where studios exist in porn right now and where they like are most justified since we have this OnlyFans and the like model that's working very well. I think studios are at their best when they're doing something that you cannot achieve in a homegrown environment. Okay. Um, like I do a lot of work with very role play heavy uh, studios like Carnal, Say Uncle, all the like all the dad porn. And I think it's really justified to do that as studio porn because you like need to decide who the roles are. You need to costume people appropriately for that. You need to put them in a set that looks like the right place. If they're a family or if they're Mormons or if they're Catholic or if they're like scouts, whatever you need, you need design elements that are really hard to put all together for just a shoot of your own at home. And once you're already there, you might as well have the lighting for it to make it look kind of cinematic since we're already going hard on concept. Conversely, like to look at Lucas as a different example, like they present gay sex kind of as an exclusive luxury item. Mm -hmm. and like it's a luxury brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's in unbelievably beautiful places with absolutely perfectly bodied people who have exactly like correctly like color balanced shots and lighting uh, and what I assume is a certain amount of like muscular body oil that like the production is required to get the level of like kind of expensive that it looks. So I think studio works best when it's doing something that I, I cannot achieve at home. There are some people though on OnlyFans that are doing studio esque work. Yeah. That I've seen. I've seen some lighting. I've seen some camera tricks that I'm like, wow, okay. Um, I look at it in awe sometimes because I feel like the studios I've worked for mm -hmm. 
were always the only fans to the studios, to the big Hollywood mm-hmm. studios. And now I feel like they're a little redundant in the sense I, you can still have, you can still get good quality stuff and there's still going to be people that are going to like it. But OnlyFans has definitely taken a lot of that market. Yeah, for yeah. sure. One of the things that I wanted to do with getting into porn and progressing, right? Because there has to be some kind of progression was kind of work into bigger projects. Mm-hmm. And I feel like now the studios are now, they have to do that basically. The one, like you're saying, like luxurious and story driven. I'm a big fan of story driven stuff. So I have seen your work. <laughs> it's really, really cool. I um, very much enjoy it. You are in, but you're playing daddy roles. You're not, I wouldn't consider, I consider you a big brother. I have a mustache, so I'm a daddy. <laughs> Is that, that's the qualification. I'm a mustache. I, I have a mustache. I, uh, I'm reasonably tall. I can talk low when I need to. So I guess I kind of default to dad. Also, when, when, when the sons are 20, yeah. okay. I'm dad. What's that like? What's, what is it like to get into that role? Because Carnal, Carnal and um, Say Uncle, mm-hmm. they, they are um, family dick, right? Family dick and gay cest. They kind of all each have a matching brand. Okay. When they came out, it was incredibly controversial that mm-hmm. it was no longer stepbrother or stepson mm-hmm. or it was father and son. Yeah. So we're going straight oh, to yeah. the meat of it. <laughs> so what... What is it? I assume you have to you you have to prepare for that. You have to get into that role. You have to kind of foreplay into that. Is it something that you already kind of find sexy? Like, is it easy to do? One hundred percent. It's okay. very easy to do. I have major daddy issues, um, and like part of what I think about when I make it is that I watching it very much watch it from the perspective of the son. Um, okay. So I so I feel like I'm making it to satisfy somebody who's watching it from the perspective of the sun. Okay. Um, and that's the thing that I kind of like about doing it is because it's this obvious like power imbalance that in a real world setting would, would be like so many red flags. Um, but if we're looking at it in fantasy, I kind of feel okay developing the fantasy and indulging in the fantasy if we're making the fantasy for the person who's in the non-power position. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's let you explore that in a way that kind of isn't safe to do in reality. It's very different. Fantasy plays such a different role in our lives, especially when we're doing porn. Is it something that you fantasized as, as like growing up as a gay kid or? Like, not about my dad, okay. um, but about which i think is you know valid um i uh well first you, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but the first first couple of men in your life are your dad and if you have brothers and stuff so it's i feel like it's natural to look mm-hmm. or to be curious not to you know want to sleep with your dad very different story but whatever to each his own yeah like i said earlier major daddy issues have always looked to like confident older men as sort of like a sexual connection. I don't know. It's a, a long historical part of my, my sexual self is looking up to somebody like being guided, being sheltered, the combined thing, the, com- the combined experience from my, from my like bottom dominated position of somebody coming to me and saying like, you were, you were embraced. You are valued. This is also going to be really intense for you right now. It's okay. Um, which is a thing I like about being in the dad role is it's about saying like, hey, this is a lot right now. Also, you want this. Let me both provide you this like somewhat scary and intense thing that you desire and do it in a way that is like supports and validates that desire and delivers you the good things you want out of it. Comforting. Yeah. As well. Wow. It's, so, it's fun. Yeah. It's, it, I like getting to be the provider. It's exciting. And you, you kind of have both sides of it nailed down then. You're, I think it's why I can be dad okay. is because I've wanted dad so much. 
So I'm like, oh, I kind of know what people are looking for or one of the tones. Yeah. There's also kind of like stern, mean dad, which is not as natural to me. Did you ever have dad? And by that, I mean like before porn, before, uh, before getting into it. Like, did you have that experience? I have had so many dads. <laughs> I have had so many dads. Oh. Um, some of them for periods of time. Uh, some of them for just like, hey, we're doing this for 20 minutes. <laughs> Let's quickly form a relationship <laughs> dynamic, get off, and go home. All right, so there's this, neighbor, this, this guy in my neighborhood when I lived in Hell's Kitchen when I was like 23 who like I majorly imprinted on as like sexual father figure who was also like so unbelievably hung that I just like couldn't process it. Um, oh, we're go, getting deep and weird right now. <laughs> oh, I love it. Keep going. Uh, I remember I'd go over and we'd hang out and I'd get kind of stoned and we would fuck and there was one point in it side note to all this i grew up catholic which factors into oh, we are going to get there it, de- <laughs> it, de- it develops my daddy issues and okay. puts a very particular spin on them and there's some point at which i am like in high thought space and i'm like taking long strokes from the biggest dick that i have ever had inside me at this point and i'm looking at him and just like oh you are both a stand-in for my father's absent love and for the God that I no longer believe in but still value. You are two literal father figure stand-ins right now. I can't say it because I both don't have words and we're in the middle of sex, but keep going. Jeez. This is doing something. <laughs> wow. Working out all my issues. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Well, talking a little bit, but I feel like we, we should get some, some context to it. What was growing up like? Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in uh, the D.C. suburbs in Virginia. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar with them. Huh? Um, Not too familiar, but I had to drop off somebody that... It was very weird. <laughs> Side note on my end. Um, I went to watch, I think, a Madonna concert or something in 2015. Hung out in D.C., and got in a cab to go to the, the hotel with my friend. And some drunk straight guy just got in the, ca- the cab with us. <laughs> and I tried using his phone to call his friends. Nobody would pick him up. And while we were at the hotel sleeping, he climbed in bed with me. Crazy shit. We had to drive him back. And he was in the D.C. suburbs of Virginia. And then he eventually became my... Um, financial planner. <laughs> he worked for a financial planning company. <laughs> Was this sort of a like, I'm sorry I put you through this. Let me do your financial planning no, for you. I, he was all about it. I was like, oh, okay, cool. My friend was like, what happened? I was drunk too. But it was, yeah, I'm sorry. You brought me back to D.C. suburbs. So you grew up. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You grew up in the D.C. suburbs of Virginia. What was sure that did. like? Um, D.C. is very, very neutral. It is such a political town. Mm-hmm. And because it's political, a lot of people come in for one one government setting and then positions change and they go back home and new people are brought in. So it's a very short-term town for a lot of people. And because of those two factors, nobody takes on any qualities that could offend somebody. You really have to like be as high quality of a person as possible while not ever doing anything that could be criticized. And D.C. overall just feels like that in every way, and it permeates through the culture. As opposed to New York, that is kind of like, have have qualities or die. Get the fuck out if you don't have any personality. Show me something. I don't care if I don't like it. Just be something. (laughs) Did you... How long were you in D.C.? I was in D.C. till I finished high school, which is uh, 2006. So I was... uh, Was there till I was 18? So major development in that area. Did you come out? In high school? I came out in high school. I was in Catholic Catholic school. What was that like? Uh, Some of the gayest places. (laughs) um, Not mine. Really? Okay. No. um, Three three of us came out at the same time in my class my sophomore year. And that was kind of it. Yeah. Like, I don't... there There was a girl the class ahead of us who I think had come out. And that was sort of all the gay people I knew about during high school. Ultimately, many people came, many, like 
one or two people a grade came out afterwards. But like, there was nobody else gay around. For okay, so not many gay people, but very gayish environment for straight guys. Would you say? Oh wait, no. you, was it was it both? Um, it was a, girls it was and boys? a yeah it was a okay. uh, mixed gender non boarding okay. Catholic school. All right, so very different, I think. Yeah, um, I've it's known, very just preppy suburban. Okay, so I've known very ca- um, very different Catholic schools where they're separated by girls and boys, mm-hmm. and the stories that I hear about like all boys schools is like they're not necessarily gay, but they do gay things. That's why for a gay person who belongs mm-hmm. to a, or who went to a Catholic high school, I would think you would see something, you know, gay men slapping each other in the locker room. Or, nope. Okay. Nope. I had, like, in the same way that I complained about D.C. being very neutral, okay. like, Catholic school was also like, don't have any qualities. Don't be any things. Things are sinful and bad. Oh. Be as blank as you can be. <laughs> And so, like, being gay in this D.C. Catholic environment means I'm like, well, there's nobody like me here, and there's nothing for me to connect to, and I automatically have this quality that people, like, even if they're not offended by the concept, are offended by the fact that I have a quality of some sort. If I want anything, I have to go make it myself. If I want space, I have to go find it myself and create it. If I want friends, if I want interests... Go do your thing, which I think continue that thread. If we're talking about background, continues here to porn, where it's like, cool, I have these interests. You might as well go make them happen and define how you do it, because you kind of have to do things for yourself before you start finding your space. Mm-hmm. What was what was fantasy like for you growing up? Ooh, or an outlet. I totally blanked when you asked me that question. Can you ask me it again in a different yeah, sure. way? Maybe maybe let's introduce porn into the picture. Yeah. What was your relationship like with, with porn growing up? But then also, was that your only outlet for sexuality? Yes. Porn, I first start interacting with largely reading it on the internet. Because, you know, dial up. It is easier to get texts than it is pictures. And eventually, we're on like file sharing services. And I'm able to download... 40 second clips of things uh and it's really easy to find tropey or archetypal character kinds of porn because those words are really easy to search Mm -hmm. so i could find stuff about like like coach or dad very easily because those are in the the file names so that possibly influences my tastes in a way that i'm just discovering saying it out loud right now just the way computers are, are structured. Um, I do have a sexual outlet, which is that I am getting into AOL's m for m chat rooms uh, and meeting up with people over the internet. In particular, the first and most frequent being this tow truck driver who I would sneak over on, uh, on like Saturday nights at like two in the morning uh and sneak into the basement and fuck around with wow yeah in the area from the area um lived maybe half an hour 45 minutes away uh i went there sometimes we would fuck in his tow truck in rush hour traffic in in like the back lots of auto yards um while he was getting calls to tow people very it definitely informs my tastes okay sexually as an adult i have this like i like like blue collar workman vibes okay um i like kind of secrecy like sleaziness sweat um which are very opposite of my upbringing i guess they're sort of like the the dangerous and the exciting other, but they're also like the first guy that I slept with. So this is the first guy that you slept with. Yeah. Okay. Before the first guy you slept with, do you have any idea in your head or do you remember the first person you lusted over? I feel like that's something that always sticks out. Ooh. It could be like, for example, when I was six, 
I wouldn't call it lust, but I definitely thought Robin from Batman and Robin was very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. I think I can, th I can think of maybe one of my first crushes that I even hardly remember this person who was in like my fourth grade class who all I remember is that his name was Christopher and he had dark shaggy hair and I remember hanging out with him outside of school one day and he was wearing a denim jacket and that's all I have but okay. I remember being like oh this person I have like kind of like secret curiosity about mm. that's interesting but what about like the first you you mentioned coach this is why this que this question came yeah. up yeah did you have a coach in school that was like no i was absolutely <laughs> unathletic in <laughs> okay. every way or a gym um, teacher or i mean yeah i had like various teachers that i thought were hot um i would run into people in the grocery store and then like jerk off about them for like f for like months um but nobody specifically stands out as an icon. Yeah. Except the repair guy or the, the tow truck guy. Yeah. Hot icon. Yeah. And Hard I think, think maybe about. what's different about him, other than just like the sex, is we... He's the first person in that role that there is play back with. Like, no, no teacher figure is somebody who I can participate in the who can participate back okay. in my fantasy. The tow truck driver participates back in my fantasy, is present, can build a rapport with, can express what the desires are and develop them. Have you kept up with him? No. No? When was the last time you saw him? Probably sophomore year of college. Okay. Yeah. So when you go away, do you, do you go away for college? I go away to college. I go to Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, I study music. Uh... Yeah. Very Carnegie nerdy Mellon? school. Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> I spend all my time with like engineers, computer scientists, and like smart nerd people are a place that I feel very happy to be around. I, it was weird coming to New York, which is all like entertainment, yeah, shiny, yeah. sparkly, and like Glitter. cold <laughs> finance people. And I was like, I need engineers. Yeah. They're help. They're, I like Pittsburgh. I've been there. Um, it's really, really cool. I like where it's set up. Mm -hmm. I like the way... Uh, it's like in a mountain, right? Don't you drive through a mountain to get there? You do drive through a mountain to get there if yeah. you're coming from... If you're coming from, oh, I guess like right coming into town, you drive under a mountain if you're coming across the river and you come out of a tunnel and suddenly, boom. Yeah, there it there's is. There's a river in a city. While you're in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. is this where you start discovering more about yourself? Um, I'm assuming at a music school... Not only are there nerdy types, but there's also gay types. Yeah. Um, I once again end up in, like, I'm in the music department. There are, like, and I'm doing theater stuff. There are plenty of gay people around me. But most of my, my time is spent in, like, a student theater group, which, other than the first three months and the last three months of college, I am the only gay person the entire time. For three and a half years, I'm the only homosexual in, its, in like a theater organization. Wow. So I continue what I'm doing. Unheard of. <laughs> I continue what I did all through, through uh, high school, which is fuck people that nobody, none of my friends know. I guess it's interesting to look at it. I'm, I guess I'm around socially around gay people for the first time, and I have very little connection with the gay circles around me. Yeah, I don't click in with the gay circles in my music or theater, like, classmates or, like, the, like, gay social scene on campus at large. I'll explore that with my therapist later. It will take too long right now. What finally brings you to New York City? Uh, I come up here for work. Okay. Uh, I'm looking to work as a musician in theater, and I come up here... Uh, I get a call from a music director I interned for, and he was like, hey, you come to New York? Do you want to work on this like Mormon musical the South Park guys are writing? I was like, sure, yeah. So I come to New York, and I like immediately start as an in, like a, basically the music intern on Book of Mormon wow. while it's in development and hang out with it through opening. And yeah. How is that? What was that? It's experience? cool. Yeah. It's great. 
like I came to New York and I worked on like the Tony Award winning best musical yeah. and I did it for years and like it's neat. <laughs> it was great. Okay, so you went to school for for music. Mm -hmm. um, instruments? Uh piano, but piano, okay. Like more Which I did see, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I did <laughs> see a, a post on Instagram. You're performing as well. Yeah. Okay. I, right. I still do a little bit of performance. Okay. Like largely I I did music professionally for ten years and burned out and was like, Oh, I kind of hate this now. And what's nice about porn is it's given me the room to just do music only when I want to. You have um solidified this idea that I have that most musicians tend to be some of the kinkiest people I've ever met. Hmm. Matthias von Fistenberg, who is a, by name, you know, mm -hmm. who is a extreme fister who loves classical music, plays piano and conducts and, what is it? I guess he, he orchestra, he writes stuff. Basically. He writes music. He writes classical music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and some of the escort stories that I've heard of people who come in for orchestras and, and symphonies and stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to share them, but the stories yeah. that I've heard are out of control and they're all musicians. I mean, one of the things about music is that it, it is about finding an emotional thread and following it and developing it, which transfers well to sex. Um, it's a, a job that comes with a great d degree of free time. So you can pursue sexual connection in ways other c people cannot like there's, kind of already a a cultural cultural like you exist outside of the structure you're not mm. one of the normal people like you don't have a lot of the rules there's a lot in place that allow musicians to be more sexual or kinkier than other people okay yeah so you did this for 10 years yeah and you still do it on and off mm -hmm. and then porn just happened to be something that Porn has always been curious. Okay. Like I watched porn in high school and in college and like always was like, what if that was me? Could I do that? Which is, you know, again, to talk about with my therapist is like about my relationship to attention, desires for being seen, being valued, or even just like being interacted with and existing. Mm -hmm. Looking back on that, like, DC Catholic upbringing where it's like you need to not have any features so that you are kind of unobservable. Yeah, you blend in. You're just... Yeah. Being observed in any way is kind of fantastic and hot and wonderful. Um, so I kind of always wanted to get into porn. And uh, I am at the cock, uh, the bar on the in the East Village. Fascinatingly because... Uh, Hans Berlin, the porn actor, wrote a gay pornography musical that I was orchestrating, and he wanted to have a production meeting there. Get out of here! You okay. at like eleven p.m. Mid midnight on like a really busy night. Did you get anything done? <laughs> well, we one hundred percent did. It was me okay. and Hans and our director and choreographer, uh, and them two looking really uncomfortable because they're like, "There's all this sex, but I'm in a professional environment. But there's all this sex, and." Hans is like, I'm at home. I've go go yeah. here for years. I love this place. This is wonderful. And I'm like, yeah, the sex is happening. Awesome. That dude has a boner right now, and I'm at work. It's so cool. <laughs> um, where am I going with this? Oh, but after an hour, and we run into things that are useful to talk about, I'm like, there's a big flesh pit happening over there. I need to go. I'm in that for about five minutes when I like get off my knees, bump directly into Joel's someone. He asked me to go home with him. Um, and I go home with Joel, who I find is a pornographic actor. Uh, we film some of us having sex. He puts 30 seconds of it on his Twitter. Two days later, it's got 50,000 views. And I'm like, oh. I kind of wrote this off as like, I'm too old. My body's not good enough. Nobody will want to see this. And 50,000 people have watched this in 48 hours. Maybe this is possible. So I go home and I talk to my partner about it and we're like, okay, I want to do porn. How does this fit into our lives and our relationship? And what would that mean? And we talk about it for like a year and a half and I keep doing music and the pandemic happens and the world shuts down and live entertainment stops and there's no music work. And six months later, like the bonus unemployment insurance stuff that's been tacked onto every insurance uh, payment runs out. Uh, so in August 2020, I'm like, all right, 
We've taken our time to figure out how this fits in our lives. I want to do it. I need another job for the time being. There's definitely culturally an excuse for doing anything right now because the entirety of the world has stopped. Uh, let's go for it. And I get my OnlyFans and I start filming and then I just do stuff. And here we are on here a couch in a hotel room. Jeez. Um, that's a crazy story. I didn't know I didn't know that you were involved in Hans, Berl- Han Berl- um, Hans Berlin's um, project. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know it was at the cock. And then certainly Joel Sumlin. I, I love Joel Sumlin. I think he's great. Um, and you definitely, I said it before, it's like the school of Joel Sumlin. You yeah. Know? And how, how, how important was he in your, like, is he your porn daddy? He's 100% my porn daddy. Okay. We refer to each other more like big brother, little brother. But yeah, he like was my guide getting into this. When I met him that first night and I was like, I've always been curious about porn. I kind of wish I could do it, but I don't feel ready. And he was like, here, let me open the door for you. Um, And then, you know, it's a year and a half later when I decide to finally walk through it. And like, I'm just some dude in New York and he's moved across the country. But I call him and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. What do I need? He then hops in and it's like, great. Let me connect you to this studio director. Let me give you these pieces of clothing I don't need anymore that I think fit how you want to portray yourself. Let me give you this advice and guides me through getting started. We end up like filming together for Guy Bone maybe nine months later. Like I see him every time I go to LA. Like we've made a whole bunch of like wonderful and silly stuff together. And I particularly in the the figuring out who I am as a like adult performer, I looked to Joel to be like, how do you do this? You are so free and joyful and encouraging. And I'm not you. I can't just do you. But there's a lot of you that I love. What of it can I learn from and is applicable to how I want to interact with the world sexually? So like Joel, both directly and indirectly, is like my mentor for this, my guide, like the guiding star that I look to for when I'm like, how do I do this? Look at what Joel did, evaluate if that's accurate or not to applicable or not to what I'm trying to do and make some decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Big um, value for him. There are definitely parts of our scene today that I was like, oh, I know this. I know. I almost knew exactly where you were going to go with certain things, but not because I think that you're not because I think that you are Joel like, but it's because I know who helped you Mm -hmm. and he has a certain way of carrying himself and, and always like very, very um, comfortable in front of the camera, but also cognizant of the camera. He pays attention to where we are. Yeah. And, and you have that too. And that was fun. And I really hope we work together more. I would enjoy that. Um, so now you've worked with various different studios. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you, oh, and photography too. You, you do a lot of photography. Yeah. How, how has porn changed who you are, right? That, that Catholic boy. Pornography has like required me to let go of shame and guilt and like those being driving forces in my life and getting rid of that means that just I like, I feel kind of silly saying it this way, but I'm kind of getting to blossom into all these parts of myself and approach myself with confidence and set goals that I thought were unattainable and work towards reaching them and uh, like express my desires clearly to myself and to other people. It's changed me at a very fundamental level in a way that, I don't know if I would have achieved otherwise. Just the confidence and clarity and self-love that I'm able to have now doing this, getting into porn required me to strip away all the things that were preventing that. And also like on a more practical level, like pornography particularly because of the flexibility of OnlyFans, gives me, weirdly gives me stability for the first time. 
part of the reason I burned out as a musician is because I was pulling all of these all-nighters and I was like going for months without a day off and my schedule is not as intense anymore. I actually can breathe. I can decide at any time how much I want to step in or step back uh, or what tone I want to approach things with. And I predominantly work for myself. I don't have to match to somebody else's goals or intentions or vision. When I have dumb, whimsical ideas, I have a platform for it now. Like, I've had all these things that I wanted to make over the years, but, like, if it, if this was 2016, it would be like, cool, I have to book a venue. I have to book mm-hmm. people. I have to pay people to participate in it. I have to rehearse it. I have to then provide an audience, like, get an audience that will then pay for like buy enough tickets to it to justify the all the expense now if i want to do a thing great i like i i saw a post on instagram uh last year that was uh this shot of galadriel and lord of the rings when she is tempted by the power of the ring and the world sort of like bleaches white behind her and her hair flies out and she was like instead of a I don't remember the line. I'm not going to try and do it. She like goes kind of crazy while she's like looking for for the lines important. Instead of a instead of a ruler, you could have a queen, and I would be terrible and beautiful. Um, but the caption on the picture is uh, a glory hole. But instead of penises, it's just someone feeding you crab rangoon. And so I called so I called somebody who does camera Kyle who who I do yeah, with, yeah, do yeah. camera stuff with and Mick Weston who I perform with and a friend who had a dungeon with a glory hole in it and I bought a bunch of Chinese food and we fed each other Chinese food through a glory hole and made a video and we put it on the internet and it was dumb and silly and I had a great time wow and it didn't now that I have a platform yeah, yeah. I have an audience and I have people who are willing to make things because, you know, actually it does kind of behoove us all to promote ourselves in this fashion. And I don't need it to... It doesn't cost so much that I need to sell tickets to it. I can just do it yeah. and then put it there. And if people want it, they watch it. It's amazing. Yeah. I love this. Yeah, no, it's nuts. So then what's next? What do you... I know that you're still... Like, we're still in the present. We're still talking about porn and you're still working with studios. Mm-hmm. What would be, what would be something that you haven't done yet that you want to do? God, that you're like, you know what? This is, I can do this. You know, like my current arc and challenge in this like sort of micro moment is finding stability and routine. It's like I, you, we started this call with talking about how much I travel, and this fall I'm not traveling. Um, I'm sticking around home so I can like put my apartment in order go to the gym and work out, go to yoga enough that my back doesn't hurt anymore, see my friends, just like develop a stable structure and ordered life that I exist in for the first time, which I also think is partly creating a future launch pad for like when I figure out a little bit more about where I want to go, I'll have a good rock to step from. I think I'm going to stick around porn for a while if, like, viewers are willing. I really enjoy this. Like, I love sex. I'm an exhibitionist. I love people seeing me have sex. Uh, So, like, I kind of get off about this all the time. It fits one of my kinks really well. But I will keep doing this for a while if I can. I... I'm curious about working in the production side of it. Okay. I am not ready to make that shift yet, but I'm sort of like developing my skills a little bit in the sense of, all right, I'm moving into, into like more professional editing software and learning how to use it. Uh, I'm upping my lighting game and figuring out how to light things for various effects, taking a concept an idea that I have in figuring out how do I move that into production, even in my like my OnlyFans or my TikTok scale, what do I need to do to tell this story effectively so that if and when I decide to move into videography, editing, producing, directing, whatever, I have some skills at my disposal to use with that. Shit. 
Real quick, before before everything, I, um, I didn't ask you about your porn name. Where did you get your porn name? Ooh, um, so I I meet Joel in March of 2019, January of 2020. Uh, a friend is working on Hustle Ball in Las Vegas, which is this like circuit party that is connected to the Gay VNs, which are some of the like gay pornography awards. Uh, this friend is working there on the tech team. He's been asked to, to find a couple of people to come and sort of volunteer work on the tech team in exchange for free tickets to the events and access to stuff. And I'm like, cool, I want to go to a like massive sex party and the gay porn awards things, which Joel is nominated for that year also, and see what the community of people in sex work is like. I'll hang some lights to do that. And I'm at a an event. I am packing up a DJ booth, a like turntable in a case, and Shishi LaRue comes over to me and is like, are you a performer? Do you want to be? Uh, and she gets interrupted by Trenton Ducati doing the same thing, and they have this little public cat fight across a party full of people about which one of them is going to get my information, and nothing ever came of it, um, but I had on this very uh like rednecky look that day uh which was part of what worked you know with the mustache and like this kind of like lanky boy thing i wear a redneck all right even though i you know am like like preppy little classical musician <laughs> catholic boy um from dc but i wanted to figure out how i could play into that and the part of like quote unquote redneck that I understand is like blue collar Appalachia because uh, you know Virginia DC is close enough to West Virginia that I spent some time there I went to college in Pittsburgh which is like that fringy area oh yeah and like has a very strong blue collar <laughs> history um, so I took Wheeling West Virginia and a like weird Old Testament name and got Jonah Wheeler out of it yeah. Wow, sorry, that was a little bit long winded. No, for that, please but. don't worry. No, that I, I that story with Chicha Larue and Trenton Ducati is good. <laughs> and I've since got, worked with Trenton. Yeah, like I don't know if he knows this, but uh, like two years later, I shoot my first say uncle scenes with Trenton. Oh, after I, okay. I've been going to Palm Springs. I like keep meeting people in Palm Springs, and they're like, "You make porn? You should meet Trenton." And I'm like, "Yes, I should. Where can I do that?" And, like, eventually three people invite me to a pumpkin carving because they're like, hey, you'll probably run into him here. So I finally meet Trenton at a pumpkin carving. We've, like, like Is it a actually pumpkin carving? Like a- it is literally a pumpkin carving, <laughs> like, and contest at somebody's house. Huh, okay. And we meet, and then we set up the thing, and then, like, he connects me to, like, Palm Springs production people when I shoot for the uncle. So it, it, it eventually got there. Shishi, I have not yet met again, but who knows? You're good. Maybe in time. For now, yeah. Maybe uh, later on. She'll yeah. come around. <laughs> when people want to find you, if they don't already know who you are, where do they go? Um, I am on most platforms as uh, Show Off Jonah. Uh, that's Twitter, Instagram, OnlyFans, TikTok. Uh, I am Jonah Wheeler, if you're trying to figure out where I am in a studio scene. My Just for Fans is... Because I did it before I had the name show off Jonah was Jonah Wheeler XXX. Yeah. And like if you want to just find me as a like human, look around Brooklyn. Look find around a Brooklyn. sling yeah. and look for me. Um I have to thank you so much for taking time out and talking thank to me. Thank you for having uh, me. This has been really fun. Yeah, yeah. No, we we would definitely have to work together again. Um I would love to do some fuck scenes with you. Yeah. Today was a suck scene, although you were you shined. I, I can see what everybody else sees in you. I want to put it in him so bad. He okay. is so pretty. Yeah. And he has the most beautiful eyes. Yeah. And I want to see his face when I come inside him. Okay. Oh, my God. I know I just came like 45 minutes ago, but I am already hard again. <laughs> okay. So, Zane Taylor, we're talking about. Yeah. He's uh, He's been around for a minute. But, yes, we will. We've been around for a minute, uh, went away for a bit, and now he's back. Uh, love working with him. I think you guys pair well. And I have to do another movie for Treasure Island. So, if you can, if you see him out there, 
Don't fuck him yet. <laughs> you have do like it. you have a couple of months. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you don't get to it by then, I'm doing it on my own. Wow. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory, as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram. And if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help support this YouTube channel so I can continue making content like this. As always, don't forget to subscribe, give this video a like, leave a comment letting me know what else you'd like me to cover. And once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers.